Good day, fellow deal makers. Welcome to the Deal Scout. On today's show, we're going to have a conversation with a new friend, Mr. Luke. Luke, welcome to the show. Appreciate you, Josh. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right. So why don't you give us an idea about who you are and what you do? Sure. So I am a real estate agent, leader, and investor in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I lead a team of about 20 agents. And I, I do still help some clients buy and sell their personal homes. I work with a lot of investors, um, generally on the smaller scale, looking for you know, single family homes to smaller apartment units, somewhere six, six to 12, six to 12 doors. Um, and then a few, you know, triplexes, quadplexes, things like that. Um, and then I've got a small real estate education company where I, I try to help young real estate agents who are just getting started in the business kind of go from, from day one to, you know, how do you survive through that first five years where 95% of agents are, are out of the business. So awesome. How did you get into real estate? Now you have a team of 20, you're teaching other people to do it and you're balling and once in a while you'll maybe sell a home yourself or, or work on a deal yourself. But how did you get into this game? Uh, so mine is actually, uh, it's, it's an interesting story. I, I was working in the corporate world. I was in strategic marketing and data analytics and my wife was a real estate agent and I was, you know, working in an office downtown and she said, you know, hey, it would be great if you had your license and then just while you're on your way home, so she didn't have to go out at five o'clock to go do a showing, I could just swing in and take care of that. Um, so I got my license part-time, fell in love with it almost instantly, um, and just really got sick of that corporate rat race. And eventually we just decided we, we were going to cut the cord and I was going to jump headfirst into real estate full-time we were going to put all of our eggs into that basket as a, as a family. And it, it started with, I have a phenomenal mentor, somebody that I've known since I was five years old, who's been very successful in the business. And I was fortunate enough to come in at a time where he was starting to grow his team. And he realized that as he was bringing new agents into the business, he didn't have enough time specifically dedicated to give them the resources that they needed. Um, so he created two almost like sales manager positions. So myself and I have a, a great counterpart. Uh, we took on that, that initial role. But as the team continued to get larger and larger, um, we realized we didn't have enough hours in the day. And then so we kind of moved ourselves up. We're more like sales directors. And then I've got, you know, four sales managers under me who kind of handle that, that triage piece of it. And then I handle some of the the larger, more in-depth negotiation questions, legal questions, things like that. Got it. And wh where are you guys located? You mentioned this. It was Kentucky, right? Louisville, Kentucky. Yep. Louisville, Kentucky. Hey, Louisville, Louisville, however you want to say it, you know, the, the locals I've uh, born and raised in this area. You know, my wife and I did move to Denver for 10 years right after college. Um, but I've been back here for, for about nine years now. And, uh, but it's, it's Louisville to us. Yeah. My business mentor or one of my mentors in my life, he lives in Walton, which I don't think is too far from you. It's an independence or something. Uh, yeah. 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 So I've, no, I've not, driven not, through. not too terribly far. Awesome. Awesome. So you guys also have good whiskey, some bourbon up, up in the, up in your area. Bur bourbon and horses. Bourbon and horses, yeah. that's, that's what we're known for here, so. Don't want to mix those too well. Don't don't drink and ride, but. Uh, no, yeah. no we, we've got signs all over town telling you, telling you don't drink and ride. <laughs> awesome. So, all right, so you get into real estate and then you, you move up to sales manager, then you move up to sales director where you're leading other sales manager. For people out there who are running, you know, their organization and it's time to build out the sales team. Do you mind if I ask you some sales questions? Sure. Yeah. So uh, I'm working with a company and they're looking to, they're, they're looking to grow and expand and, and they're, you know, the, it's primarily founder driven sales, right? So the, the leader of the organization or the group does all the sales and, and they go, how do we, what's the next step? Is it to hire a salesperson, a low level salesperson, get them pounding calls all day? Is it to hire a sales manager or, you know, so they could start building out their own sales team? Like, what do you think? What is your opinion? Well, I, for us, it was more about the decision 
to scale and to realize that you'd probably have to take two steps back in order to take five steps forward. Um, you know, I started doing the math a long time ago and it's like, I could kill myself and I could sell a hundred homes a year and spend no time with my family, but I could help out a hundred families or I could find 20 agents that are just 25% as good as me. And I could have five times the impact, right? Um, so making that decision to start scaling and realizing that, again, you're going to have to take that small step back uh, in, in income specifically for the first couple of years as you are investing in the growth of the team and making sure that everyone that you're bringing on is, you know, fed, so to speak, with, with leads and um, high quality prospects. Once they make that decision, it starts getting fairly simple. I mean, there's, I don't know that there's necessarily a wrong way to do it once you make that decision. Uh, I don't know that you necessarily need to bring on a sales manager in the beginning, but I mean, you can start with just bringing on a buyer's agent, just someone who is out handling all of your buyers for you. Uh, you know, the way the real estate game works is you can work a lot more listings than you can buyers because buyers take more time. You've got to drive out from home to home, showing them multiple places. So yeah, I got my start in real estate coming from a background of construction. Uh, I had my PhD, post hole digger, uh, in construction, right? Digging, digging holes for my dad and, and doing this. And then I saw these, you know, fancy cars drive up for sale sign in the front yard, drive off and making a lot of money. So that's when I got my real estate agent license and started down that path. And, uh, when you get started, I worked the floor time and, and essentially worked with buyers all the time. And, you know, mm -hmm. I come to, love working with investors specifically, not necessarily listing homes and, and working directly with buyers. But you know, when it comes to getting your start, you said you have a passion for kind of people getting their start in real estate. Let's just say, you know, I come to you wet behind the ears and going, Hey, I want to start in my real estate just past my, my test, no background, no nothing. How would I, what would be your ideas of me getting started? So I tend to work off of a triangle. Um, I, I work in threes. Um, you know, I was very fortunate when I was in the corporate world to get to work with a lot of consultants and a lot of consulting agencies who helped us really try to dial in our, our avatar, our target market. And one of the things that we found was over 40% of the people were a group that we called simplicity seeking followers, which essentially meant that if you gave them more than three steps to do something, they weren't going to do it. Um, so I, I tend to work in threes and it's nice with the, with a triangle because you get the three sides. Um, but I try to focus on three things as, as people are coming into the business. Um, one, I help them really develop and work with their sphere of influence. Um, and whether that's one person or a hundred people, really how, how to deep dive into that sphere and how to grow that sphere um, and not be that, you know, that, that cousin or relative or friend that everybody starts ducking their phone calls because, you know, every time you're calling, it's like, hey, uh, can you write down the names of three people who want to buy or sell real estate in the next <laughs> yeah. four months? Yeah. Uh, no, that's, that's, not, that's not what we're looking to do, but we, we really help them dive deep into their sphere, help them get that dialed in. Um, number two, we really focus on how to win in today's market because the market, I mean, is shifting on an almost weekly basis, but we're constantly working on how do you survive? How do you win in today's market? And then finally, third, we teach them how to work with investors um, for several reasons. One, a lot of agents won't touch investors uh, either because the numbers are too small with somebody who's just looking for, you know, in my market, $70,000 rental properties. Uh, two, they're afraid of it. Uh, it's just something that they don't know or understand. And so they stay away from it. Um, so what we try to do is we try to get them very comfortable with investors because A, investors will keep you fed when the market starts slowing down. I mean, if, you know, knock on wood, but we have another, another large market correction, it's the investors who are sitting on cash who are going to stimulate it. They're going to keep you in the business. It's also throughout the time of year as you start getting into the holidays, as traditional real estate sales from Thanksgiving through New Year's really slow down, that's when the investors start picking up, trying to get those last minute tax breaks throughout the end of the year. Yeah. And then three, getting in good with investors. 
uh, you know, you may be helping them buy multiple sixty and seventy thousand dollar properties, um, but they also have to have a place to live for themselves. Uh, generally, they're they're fairly affluent. Uh, and what's the old adage? You know, you are the combination of the five people you spend the most time with. Um, so these wealthy investors are probably spending time with other wealthy investors. Um, so that again just kind of grows your sphere of influence with the right type of people. And so we kind of keep that, that triangle rolling. Yeah. My first listing was a mobile home, a single mobile home. <laughs> I think it was $33,000 located in the national forest, which is about a 35 minute drive from where I lived. I made $300 in commission after working my butt off, showing that thing multiple times, I probably lost money. If it was today's gas prices, this was 20 years ago. If it was today's gas prices, I would have lost money on that deal. I found those signs, you know, we buy houses cash. I called them all up and I started doing 10 offers a week, you know, for the different buyers. I, I created an investor list and such like that. So working with investors was scary. What would, what if they asked me a question I didn't know? What if they asked me IRR, cap rate or this or that, right? Didn't know, but I knew how to knock on doors, right? Um, as you are working, let's talk specifically with investors. Right. What's the best way to get started working with investors if I'm a new agent? What I tell my all my new agents is one, I think you need to start just kind of understanding investor math, you know, looking at what rates of return look like. Um, two, I think you need to understand uh, cost of some trades. So if you walk in and you say, OK, this needs carpet, this needs paint, having a general idea of price per square foot. Um, but three, the, the absolute easiest thing to do is just go find a deal. If you find a deal, we'll find you an investor. That's finding the investor is the easy part. It's finding the deals sometimes that's more challenging. So if they can find the deals, I tell them I've got a whole slew of investors and it's their client. They can take them. It's their commission. I, you know, just find the deals. I will find you the investor. This is the whole which came first, the chicken or the egg, the dollar or the deal. I have so many people coming up to me and they go, Hey, I need some investors, you know, for a real estate project. Okay. Well, tell me about the deal. Well, we don't have it yet. We're looking to secure the financing or the secure the capital partner. And then we work our way backwards in the deal. And I go, man, start with the deal. Find me a deal. I'll find you money. Yeah. And I think that, I think that it's their fear or insecurity that prevents them from actually finding the deal first. They think that if they have money in hand, the deal's going to be easier. Uh, what's your thoughts of that? I agree with you 100%. I mean, I, I think it's a lot harder to go out and find the money on the front side um, because especially if you think about it, if you put your investor hat on, if you're, and this is what I tell my agents, if you're investing your money before you agree to invest anything, don't you want to see what it's going to be invested in? I'm not looking to hand you a blank check. I'm, you're trying to earn my business. I'm not trying to earn yours. Uh, and so I, I tell them, it's like, hey, you go out, do the legwork, bird dog a deal, the investors will be there. And once you prove that you can go out and find those deals and make them some money, they will come back. Yeah. All right, Luke. So you and I are working together for, you know, first week of I've never been in real estate before. And I go, hey, man, out of that three leg triangle, I really want to work with investors, but I need to go find a deal mm -hmm. new in real estate. Maybe I just even moved to you know, Louisville, right? And I'm like, I don't know anybody here. I don't have a sphere of influence here, but I'm willing to find a deal. What direction would you have for me? Um, I'm going to tell you, you are going to be, we're very big in our office on shadowing uh, because we use this model that we call adopt and adapt, right? Where it's, I want you to see how multiple people analyze a deal. I want you to see how multiple people run a listing presentation. I want you to see how multiple people run a buyer consultation because I want you to see different word tracks because there's not one way to do this business. I want you to be able to see the way that maybe I do it and I want you to adopt the things that you really like and I want you to adapt the things that you don't think fit your style or personality. So I want you to start shadowing people as they're out either showing investors or they're out just previewing investments. And that includes me. I'm out previewing investments on an almost daily basis. Uh, not only for my investor clients, but for me personally. Um, and so I say, hey, just go out and just go shadow. See what they're looking for on a deal. And then 
you will be surprised how much you're able to pick up. You can ask specific questions and you can see what's on the market rather than a hypothetical, oh, hey, if this house came up for 85,000 and you think you can rent it for 825 a month and you run these numbers. No, let's go out and let's actually look at something. Let's put our eyes on something tangible. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So we're, we're going to be doing this in the future. We're going to be walking deals. Uh, we, we have, uh, investors by mobile home parks, multifamily, industrial kind of, you know, all sorts of different niches within the real estate industry. But let's just say you and I are walking a real estate deal, pick a category of real estate that you really like. Uh, for, for me specifically. Yeah. You, you specifically, I, I love duplexes. I love duplexes too. All right, cool. So you and I, we go out. And uh, I find a deal. I say, hey, man, I got a deal on the hook. It's a duplex. They, they're interested in selling. They haven't really discussed numbers yet. And I'm a newbie. So, Luke, will you come with me and have a conversation, do a property walk, and then have a conversation? What would that look like as an investor talking about a deal, doing a, you know, scouting out a deal? We found a deal, got it on the hook, potentially. But you're, I'm, I'm depending on you to kind of take me over the edge of how to get that thing bought. So, for me, it's we're walking in and we're talking to the seller and just like, Hey, obviously this is a duplex. This is an investment for you right now. Um, let me ask why, why are you selling? Um, and that, that's going to be my first question is I want to see what the motivation is. And if nine times out of 10, at least at, at that point, whether it's true or not, their answer is, well, I'm not really looking to sell, but if the number's right, sure. I'll sell. It. Um, and then we start, we start going through and, I don't immediately point out the flaws. I know there are some agents and it, it works very well to say, oh, well, you know, I, I see this stain over here and I see we've got some paint issues over there and we've got a busted door here. Um, just as I'm asking them to kind of walk me around the property, I'll just kind of stop and just kind of linger and just stare at an issue. Um, nine times out of 10, I found that they'll point it out and they'll give me a story for it. And I can start to figure out, okay, is this something that is that has been here for a while? Is this signs of a, a lingering ongoing problem, something that's, you know, tends to come back? Uh, really what I'm looking for, I'm looking for new issues versus old issues. Because if there's older issues that are floating around there, I'm starting to wonder, is there a lot of deferred maintenance? Yeah. Uh, and so we're just, we're walking through and... I try to get the seller to give me a number on the front side just to figure out, hey, what, what are you thinking here? If they won't give me a number, um, I tend to find a trick I learned from, from my mentor in real estate. I'll pull up, let's say the, the Zestimate on Zillow, which I, I have found aren't accurate very often. Um, but I know where my number is compared to what this estimate says. I like to pull up this estimate and show it to them and then read their eyes to see how they mm -hmm. see what they're thinking. Um, I want to know is that, are they pleasantly surprised? Are they disappointed? Or does it feel like, yeah, that's probably pretty close. And then that can help me make a determination to see, are we just crazy off at this point or do we think we might have some potential? Um, you know, once you start getting above the duplexes, when you get into quadplexes and especially six, tens, twelves, things like that, um, you know, it's harder to rely on something like like a Zestimate. Um, but a, a duplex, I found, you can still find good comparable sales in most areas. And yeah. if nothing else, it it's not about the number; it's about me gauging their reaction to the number. Yeah. Yeah, because then you, you could start now. This happens a lot. You know, people sometimes think that people oftentimes think that their their baby, their property, especially if they've if it's been in the family for a long time, is more valuable than it is, or they don't realize the cost of replacement, repairing a roof, uh, you know, new AC units or a new septic tank or new this or new that, right? So how do you deal with unrealistic numbers? Like if they're just, it's completely unrealistic. Like you can't make it work as an investment or even to float it. If you were going to even live in one side and rent out the other. Sure. And I mean, I, I try to bring hard numbers and I say, Hey, let me have some of my guys come over here and put together some quotes for us. 
um, just so that I've got hard concrete numbers that I can show them. About half the time you end up getting pushback that says, well, hey, these are your guys. They're just inflating the numbers to try to make you feel better. It's like, okay, well, why don't you bring in some guys? Mm -hmm. You bring in your people and see what they say. Let's get some quotes there and let's see how well they mesh up. Um, because I know most of most of my people, I work with them so much that I'm probably getting one of the better deals in town. Uh, and if they don't know somebody specifically, especially for something like plumbing, they're going to call one of the big, what I call the advertisers, you know, the ones that are advertising on TV and everything else, and they're going to be crazy expensive. And it just makes my quote look even better. It makes me look more genuine, more reputable, um, and more honest. Yeah. And then, you know, while you're in this discussion, uh, do you have, do you, are you trying to lock up the deal at whatever number early on, uh, with some due diligence and some back out options or, or do you just kind of take it slow letter of intents and move your way through the process? It really depends. I mean, it, like if I think that there's like a, a smoking deal to be had there, um, I, I try to just hop on it and, and get it done. Um, and I'm also not the type, I'm not the investor that is going to haggle over two grand. Um, it, I would miss more than I would, than I would gain from that. And I think with the way, and I, I still think we have a ways to go on appreciation as much as the market seems inflated right now. I still think that things are going up over time, um, that I can make that back fairly easily and very quickly. Yeah. And you can do value adds to the property to, you know, when you get above duplex or single and you get into dues and, and such like that. Um, let's just say you acquire the duplex. What are some things that you do to value add duplexes, tries, quads that you can do to, you know, raise rents? That's one thing, you know, like, do, have you seen other ways to uh, increase the, the revenue streams from properties? Uh, we have. I mean, there's there's different things that we've done, uh, you know, specifically like if there's no off street parking, um, if we can find a way if maybe there's alley access in the back um, to take a portion of the yard um, and gravel that off and then pop a fence in the back so that they can have some semblance of privacy. It's very inexpensive, especially when compared to the cost of building a garage. Uh, which allows me to raise rents fairly easily. Uh, or if there is a garage, I've had a lot of success. Generally what I found in these small multi-units, the twos, threes, and fours, there's a garage, but it's been something that the owner has used for their own personal storage. Um, and I either I'll float it out to one of the tenants at 150 bucks a month, or I have found local businesses, you know, landscapers, especially always looking for places to park things will just run out the garage. And so it turns my fourplex into a four plus garage. So I've got a fifth revenue stream coming through there uh, that, that tends to help out. They tend to sign very long-term leases, which are, you know, good for me. Um, it's just a quick little quick hits in revenue. Yeah, that's great, man. Best deal, worst deal. And from the, from the things you've experienced? Um, best deal. We had a, um, we had an investor that was essentially liquidating. They were, they were selling a, a great deal of all, all of their properties. And this, this is actually how I really got started in investing. You know, I, we, my wife and I kept our first property uh, and when we, when we moved, we kept the first one as a rental, kept it for several years. But when I really started getting into real estate investing, I had a couple of buddies that we, we were just going to buy a little kind of rundown $20,000 property that needed a whole lot of work that we could do a lot of the work ourselves in an up and coming area. We were going to pay cash, do the work ourselves, get it as a rental and just try to try to pull it together. Well, we, and an investor who was liquidating, who was retiring and moving out of town fell into our lap. And so we ended up buying 13 on the spot. Um, so we went from trying to buy one to buying 13. So we kind of pieced that deal together and we got it up and running. And this investor came back and they had two properties left. They had two single family homes and they, they needed to, to dump them. And they both had tenants and 
we wanted one, we did not want the other. It was not an area of town that we were interested in renting in. It was far from the others. Um, and so we said, hey, we want property A, we don't want property B. And the, the owner said, well, I won't sell you A unless you buy B. So I ran the numbers and I said that we could spend uh, $45,000 on just A alone and make the money that we needed. So we offered $39,900 for both, got them. So it was essentially, it was a buy one, get one free. This second house that we got for free that we didn't want had a tenant that had been in there. She was paying $420 a month. Um, we owned that property for two years. She paid $420 every month. She never missed a month. She was late twice a year when the rent fell, uh, when the first fell on a holiday and a weekend. And she would call to say, hey, the rent won't be there until the sixth because the mail is slow. Is that okay? We had to send an electrician out there one time to change an outlet, cost us 150 bucks. We cash flowed that thing $420 a month for two years and then sold it for $38,000. Uh, so, I mean, we're not talking large scale numbers, but a house that we didn't want that we got for free, cash flowed for two years and then we sold for 38 grand. Great, I, I will take those all day long. I'll take those all day long, uh, yeah. Worst deals, um, boy, there's there's probably more more than I can count. Uh, but so there is an area of Louisville that's called Old Louisville, which is the largest collection of Victorian mansions I think in the country. It may be second to New Orleans, but just like this massive area of just nothing but these old Victorians from the late 1800s. Most of them have been chopped up into apartments, and. We bought a fiveplex that should have been a phenomenal deal. And it was from a sense we bought it under value, but the thing was a money pit every single month. You can't separately meter them. We were having seven and $800 water bills, uh, which we get water bills every two months here. So I mean, three, three to 400 bucks a month in water bills, you know, plus three to 400 a month in ele electric bills. Um, they had box gutters. I don't know. Are you familiar with box gutters at all? Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if you needed new gutters, it's 35 to 40 grand to yeah. put new gutters on there. Um, so we never cash flowed on a monthly basis on this property. And we sold it a couple of years later and we made a little bit of money off of appreciation, but I'm by far the worst thing yeah. I've, I've ever had. It's I stay away from those fours and fives now because of that. Just I'm gun shy. Yeah. Now I hear you. I think that a deal like that, even if it, even if it did cash flow, like if it's going to be a pain in the ass, if it's going to be something that's going to take away my attention, if I'm going to get constant phone calls or whatever, man, it, I'd rather not make money than have more headache. Mm -hmm. I don't mind making, but it better be good money. Right. Right. Has to offset. Yeah, totally. Do you guys, uh, with your own personal holdings or with the groups that you work with, do you prefer using, you know, property managers or managing yourself? So myself and my business partner, we, we have different philosophies on it. Um, he, he likes to manage it ourselves because he likes the additional cash flow. Um, I'm not as much of a fan because I want to be as hands off as possible. Um, so we, we compromise and then depending because we're, we're constantly trading properties. Um, and so when our portfolio is a little bit smaller, we'll, we'll come through and we'll, we'll manage ourselves. Um, but as it starts to get a little bit larger, you know, we were at one point, uh, we had 15 properties and we were managing them ourselves and just, that's a lot killing ourselves with it. And then we acquired, we found another investor liquidating, acquired 15 more. So it doubled. Yeah. Greatest day for me because we were pretty well forced to turn it over at, at that point. Um, you know, I hate giving up the revenue, but at the same time, to, it, it's a cost of doing business um, that I would rather spend my time scouting new deals um, and then growing my my other real estate sales side, really helping my agents develop. So, yeah, no, man, that is it's so true. It's what is the highest and best use of your time, and I deal best with, I'm not the best manager. I deal best when I'm finding new deals, new opportunities, new money, new, you know, new resources, new partnerships. Like that's where, that's where I make 
Um, so I, I am a big proponent. My family and I are a big proponent on using external property managers. I don't want the phone call. I don't want that stuff. It's not just the revenue. It's the, the mental drain of, of that kind of stuff. That's me personal. Um, yeah. as you're, as you're doing, you know, deals and, and working with your agents and, you know, kind of working on that, that triangle method, which I, I really like, cause we do need to keep things simple, especially salespeople, right? Keep it simple, do deals, make money. Right. And then, uh, go home and hopefully hang out with the family. Um, what are some, as you're, as you're looking for other agents to come on other salespeople, what are some like red flags that you're like, sales is not for you. If I find somebody who is, who is bouncing around quite a bit, um, from job to job, industry to industry, uh, it's, it's a red flag for me. It's just somebody that hasn't figured it out yet. And that's okay. I spent a time in my life where I was still trying to figure it out. Um, but moving to this, to this commission only role where we provide a ton of support and a ton of high quality leads, but you still have to get out there and you got to work them. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, if I see that bouncing around a lot, that is, that's a big red flag for me. Um, or if someone doesn't seem coachable, um, that's also, I mean, the real estate side, you can teach it to anybody. Look, if I can figure it out, anybody can figure this thing out. Um, but I had to be coachable. You know, I had to set my ego to the side and realize that I don't know it all. And yes, my life experiences can come into play. Um, and yes, I can, I can utilize those things, but I still need to listen to smarter people who have been in the business longer, who have a proven method of success. True. Absolutely. Um, on, behind you, I see some books, some awards. If, if the office or wherever you're at burning down, you could only grab one thing off that bookshelf, what would it be? Who, um, you know, this book here, something I was, I was super proud of, um, because it was, it was a time in my life. So hold on a second. People are just listening into the podcast. You oh, yeah, sorry. What, it's okay. This is called small steps, sizable gains. It's 21 days to a better you. It's, it's a book that I wrote in 2017. It was a time in my life where I was kind of trying to figure it out and trying to figure out, okay, what are my next steps? I, I really know that I'm, I'm primed to make a big leap, but I needed to know how to do it. And I was listening to all the podcasts, all the gurus, all of these people that, you know, the, the Grant Cardones of the world who I, I think have a lot of great insight, but it's like, Hey, you gotta, you gotta quit your job and just move to move to Miami. If that's where, if that's where the person that you want to be like, is that tell me you're going to go work for free for a year. And, and I got, I got two kids and I got a mortgage. I can't just quit my job and do that. Um, so I said, there has to be a way for people who aren't quite there yet to still be able to make change. You don't have to make these big, massive, drastic changes. You can have these small incremental adjustments that lead to these exponential gains. Um, and so what I did is I started tracking what were the things I was doing, just small little things on a daily basis that weren't, didn't seem like major disruptors by the ones, but when I pieced them all together, they were completely changing my life. Um, so this book is all about just reading one chapter a day, and the chapters, you could have them done in about three to four minutes, but it's just something small that they can do each and every day. Um, but it was, it was something I was just doing for myself. And I told somebody that uh, somebody I, I trusted and liked very much, like, hey, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a book. And I mean, just laughed and you don't know anything about writing a book. You barely passed English class and you can't do that. And I was like, screw you. I bet I can. Um, so I just, I kind of put my head down. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't even tell my wife that I was working on this thing, knocked it out. And then I came to her and I was like, I wrote a book and it's going to get published. And she was like, you don't know any publishers. And I pulled up Amazon and I was like, well, here it is for sale right here. Mm -hmm. um, went out, promoted it, and it landed on an Amazon bestseller list. Yay. Um, I, it's, it is terrible. I mean, it is absolutely terrible. And even in the the intro, I say, look, if you're looking for, for grammar and properly, you know, punctuated sentences, that kind of stuff, I ain't your guy. I write like I talk. Um, but it, 
it seemed to speak to people who were just looking to be able to do small things. Mm -hmm. um, and then behind me on the other side, I was always really big about journaling. And, and I would find these journals and I was constantly going through trying to find new journals that had the things that I wanted and the, the structure that I needed, but I just, I couldn't quite get them all. Some would have a few pieces and then I have to get another one with a few different pieces. And it was like, well, hey, I've published a book before. Um, why don't I just design something that works for me? I sent it to somebody on Fiverr for 125 bucks who just designed it for me, sent it up to Amazon. And, you know, whenever I need a new one, it's print on demand up there. Um, I've sold a few of those as well. But I mean, those are mostly just Amazon keeps them around. So they print them and just send them to me when I need a new one. Yeah. Dude, super cool, man. What did you most discover about yourself writing a book? Um, I discovered that I had more to say than I thought I did. Um, you know, you, you start to, to learn that like, hey, you don't have to be Tony Robbins to impart wisdom. You just have to be six or 12 months ahead of somebody else. Mm -hmm. Like you can, there are people that are just a year behind you that they need to know everything that you know. Super cool. Yeah. All right. One of my favorite parts of the show, I pull out these uh, deck of cards that have questions right. on it because I have limited brain space that doesn't create the, the most awesome questions. So tell me when to stop. <laughs> tell me when stop. to stop. Okay, here we go. Here's the question. What's a character trait that you hope you never pass down to your kids? And what's one that you do hope you pass down to your kids? Ooh. Character trait that I hope I don't pass down to my kids. Um, I hope that they don't inherit my temper. Um, I, I tend to get very frustrated and, and angry about things when they're not going my way. I'm, I'm very hard on myself in that sense. Yeah. Um, I, I have very high expectations for myself. And in turn, I think I put unfair expectations on others. Um, I expect them to have the same expectations of themselves. And that's just, it's not a fair characterization. It makes me frustrated. It causes me to just say, you know what, damn it, I'll just do it myself, uh, which takes up more of my time, which I don't have a lot of. Yeah. Um, but one thing I do hope they inherit from me, my work ethic. Uh, that has always been something for me. I always knew that I was rarely, if ever, going to be the smartest person in a room. Um, but I wasn't going to be outworked. So cool, man. Um, as you're building this business, what does, how do you measure your success? You got 20 team members that you're building. You've got your own investment portfolios. You got your own two kids. You wrote a book. What's, what's winning look like for you? How do you know you're winning as a deal maker? It, it's really shifted a lot over the last probably 12 months. And part of that I think is, is COVID, COVID causing people to kind of reevaluate where things are. Um, I used to be very, very analytical and numbers driven, which I still am. You can, you can never completely get, get rid of that. Um, but it, all of my goals were always very number driven. I need to make X number of dollars. I need to do this many deals. And I think some of that was vanity driven. Um, but when I really got down to the root of it, it was all about how do I have more impact for my family and how do I have more impact for others? Yeah. And sometimes going after those goals and chasing those numbers was counterproductive to what I ultimately wanted to do. I was spending so much time working that I wasn't getting to spend the time with my family. So I was hitting some of the metrics, but I wasn't serving what I ultimately wanted uh, so I've really started shifting to more qualitative goals mm -hmm. with quantitative actions behind it. Um, and for me, it's just, it's about impact. How do I change lives through real estate and how many lives can I change? It goes back to what we talked about at the beginning where, you know, I could kill myself for a hundred deals or I could find 20 agents who do 25% of that and have five X the impact. Yeah. Um, so how do I go out? How do I scale? And that's why I've created some of these courses and things now. It's just like, how do I just get this information out into quick, easy, digestible formats? That's all, that's all I want to do. And if I can go out and I can change lives and I can help others get into the business and help them realize 
that their goals are possible and what they want to do, then to me that that's winning. Yeah. Tell me about uh, one of the online course, or is I assume it's an online course. Tell me about one of the courses, maybe one of your best selling courses. Um, actually, there there is one that goes very in depth on the triangle that we talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's all about just crushing it in your first three hundred and twenty days of real estate. Um, and it doesn't have to be the first 320 days. You could be a, a three or four year vet, um, that just, you know, but you're, you're kind of in a, in a lull or a dead spot, or you've never really gotten up and going. Uh, but that has been, been one that's been super impactful. Yeah. Awesome, man. Awesome. During this interview, what questions should I've asked you that I screwed up and just didn't ask you like completely blanked and I was worst host ever. Oh, um, probably, I don't know. I mean, like it's, I felt like we, we, we had a great conversation and that, that's what I love about this format is we get to do this as, as a conversation piece. And that's what zoom has really opened up too. Is like, I can see your face. I can see your reactions. I can feed off of your energy. And that's, uh, I think the way that you do this is, is really cool. Thanks, man. I love compliments. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Make, you know, like, and, and I say that a little joking, right? Like a little tongue in cheek, but I think in this world today, people only point out like the negative or they'll put out, you know, criticism. And you took that opportunity to go, nah, Josh, I think you actually did good. Like compliments make people feel good. It makes them feel unique and special. So like I, you know, I, I remove filter in my mouth when I'm doing podcast interviews. And that's the first thing that came to mind is, man, that felt good. Thank you. Yeah, well, you know, hey, like, like I said, it, I, I'm a pretty straight shooter. I wouldn't say it if it wasn't true. So. <laughs> You're like, Josh, actually, that was the shittiest show I've ever been on. I've been on a lot. This is terrible. This isn't going to air anywhere, is it? Yeah, please unplug this thing immediately. Um, for the for new agents or even agents who want to step up their game and they want to maybe get some education or maybe figure out how to do a deal with you or join your team, what's a good place for people to connect with you and do a deal together? LinkedIn is where I am by far most active. I know it probably should be Instagram. That seems to be where everybody is these days, but I just, I've never really gotten Instagram yeah. and it's, it's been tough for me, for me to adopt. But if you, um, if you go to linkedin.com slash sales and negotiation coach, it'll actually take you to my page or just look up Luke Andrews. Um, LinkedIn is, is by far the, the best place to catch me and where I'm most active. Copy, copy. And I'm just going to make sure that you and I connect also on, uh, on LinkedIn. There you are. You just got a new follower, buddy. Boom. Boom. Love it. The power of LinkedIn and social networking. Um, one last thing, if there's one more piece of advice you could give someone who's just about to pull the trigger and get their real estate license and, and, and they want to focus on that side of the business, one more piece of advice for them. What would you say? I would say strongly consider whether or not you want to join a team. Um, don't focus on splits, focus on value. Um, that's, I see so many people that come into this business and they get swayed by these high splits, these 80, 20s, 90, 10s, even 75, 25s, but they're getting literally nothing for it. And it's like, Hey, would you rather have 90% of four deals or would you rather come to my team and take 50% of 30, 60 years, yeah. which is I've had multiple agents in their very first year in the business do 30 to 40 deals, um, yeah. six figure earners from day one who have little to no sphere that come in that just work solely off leads and what we teach them to do. Um, and for us, find, find a team, find a mentor, find a leader who is willing to get on the same page with you um, and who is willing to be there for your growth. Uh, for me, I tell my agents, Hey, think about what do you want to do in three to five years? If you want to be a leader on our team, if you want to be just a very large independent agent, if you want to go start your own team, I will open up the playbook. I will show you how to do it. I will build you the roadmap. Um, you just have to tell me what you want. Um, cause most people think, well, it's like, I'm not going to tell him that I'm going to start my own team. Cause then he'll try to hold me back. And he, I'm not scared of the competition. I'm here to change lives, impact lives. So I will build you the roadmap. I will show you exactly what you need to do. Um, But just don't get caught up in the splits. Look for the value. That is, that is amazing piece of advice. Cause a lot of times people, you know, they'll, they'll read a book on, 
on real estate and they'll go, you know, here you need the splits and here's how many deals. But like the experience deal flow, like the best thing for deal flow and, and the best way to get deals is to have traction and to have activity. The busy people get the most deals, right? The, the people doing the most deals get the most deals. They yeah. come to them. When you do a deal, because then if you sell a house, they, they might need to buy a house then. And then their friend needs to, oh, you just sold your house. Who'd you sell it for? A sign in the front yard gets new deals. Great piece of advice. Good job. Thank you so much, Luke. That's that. awesome. Yeah. All right. So uh, fellow deal makers listening in, as always, reach out to our guest and say thank you for being on the show. Find a way to uh, learn from them, do a deal with them, connect with them, and maybe even join their team. As always, reach out to our guests and say thank you. Uh, if you are working on a deal, looking for a deal, um, and you want to talk about it here on the show, head on over to thedealscout.com. Fill out a quick form. Maybe get you on the show next. Till then, talk to you all on the next episode. Peace.